Welcome to this holy worship of Maundy Thursday, a night where we set a time to focus on and meditate on the sufferings and the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus, things that he goes through and suffers through on our behalf so that you and I in our sinfulness, in our brokenness, can be made whole and healed and forgiven. This evening we especially focus on the institution of the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, a meal that Jesus gives to us, not just bread and wine, but Himself, and not just for our sake of remembering what He did for us, but so that our sins may be forgiven so that you and I, through His body and His blood, are made whole, healed, and forgiven. This evening we begin our worship with our opening response, where we celebrate who our God is. And we also begin with confession, admitting our sinfulness and our brokenness, our need for forgiveness and healing. And we receive absolution the very promise and words of Christ that you and I are forgiven, that He has done this work on our behalf. I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our sins, imploring God our Father for the sake of His Son Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have fallen short of your glory. We admit that we have not lived as your people should. Like Peter, we have often denied you with our words and actions. Like the apostles, we have abandoned you with our hearts by loving and chasing after idols. Forgive us and restore us by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath meant for your sins on your behalf so that you may drink from his cup of forgiveness. Know that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as we celebrate Maundy Thursday, as we observe this holy evening of Christ spending his last moments with his disciples before his betrayal, his arrest, and his eventual death on Good Friday, one of our main focuses is often on the meal of communion or the Lord's Supper. Because it is this evening that Christ instituted this meal for his disciples, for his church, for you and me. And so as we think about this meal, what I want to do this evening is look at three different meals that are found in God's Word. And what they mean for you and I, what they mean for our relationship with Jesus. I don't know what your favorite meal ever is. And I don't just mean the favorite food type that you love to eat over and over and over again. I mean the, the actual meal itself. Because you and I know that as important as the food is to a good meal, just as important is the company, the occasion, the celebration that goes with it. There's more to a meal than just the food. My favorite meal of all time happens to be this meal at a restaurant called Magnolia's in Charleston, South Carolina. And the food was absolutely amazing. It was way better than I anticipated and I couldn't get over how great everything tasted. But the most important part of the meal was who I was sharing it with. I was sharing it on a vacation with my wife where we were celebrating our marriage and our love together and our friendship. And so for me, it's not just a memory of, wow, this food tasted absolutely amazing. It's also all the memories that go with it of the time that we spent together, who I was spending that time together with. Because again, a meal is more important than just the food. It's also about the occasion, the celebration, and most importantly, who you invited to your table. You don't just invite people you don't want to spend time with. You invite people that you love, that you care about, or people that you want to get to know better in the hopes of building a better relationship, a better friendship. See, we are very selective and particular about who we invite to our meals. And this is a theme that runs throughout Scripture. As we will see tonight throughout God's Word, there are different meals. And there are different people who are invited to these meals. Sometimes it's really bad and leads to terrible disaster. And other times it leads to great celebration and salvation. And in Genesis chapter 3, we have the first meal ever in the Bible. And it happens with our parents, Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, as they're living perfect lives in the Garden of Eden and in the perfect relationship with God, are invited to a meal. But this meal is going to be a complete disaster, not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of humanity. Because they don't eat this meal with God. They end up eating this meal with Satan, the serpent. And as they are talking and interacting, Satan speaks to Adam and Eve and says, No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So the first meal recorded in Scripture is between Adam, Eve, and Satan. Now you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with me? Because when I eat a meal, I'm not, I'm not inviting Satan to the party. Right? I'm not 
I'm not putting a reserve sign, I'm not putting a plate out, I'm not saving a seat for Satan to come into my meals and to come into my home and to come into my life. But before we just dismiss Adam and Eve as being incredibly foolish and thinking, how could they, how could they be so foolish? How could they be so sinful? How could they be so terrible? We also have to be honest about our own sinfulness and brokenness. Because the way that they invite Satan into the meal is deceptive and subtle. And there are ways that you and I continue to do this in our lives. The first is that they believe the lie that says you will be like God. Now most of you probably don't walk around thinking I'm God or I'm like God. But here is the temptation that you and I fall into. Here's how you and I uninvite God from the guest list and invite Satan into the party instead. We simply tell God, not now, I've got this. I, I'm in charge, I'm in control. God, I will let you give suggestions on what I should do, how I should behave, how I should act, how I should speak, but I get to make the final decision. See, maybe we don't say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be like God. But oftentimes we say it with our thoughts and our behaviors. That unquenching thirst to be in control. To put God outside of the party and say, every once in a while we'll call on you. We'll ask for your advice. We'll look to your Bible and to your word to see if you have any suggestions on this matter. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that's in charge. I get to make the final decision. So perhaps you and I uninvite God out of our lives and out of our meals more than we like to admit. We have more in common with and Adam and Eve that we want to actually be honest about. Now the other way that we behave like Adam and Eve in terms of having a meal with Satan rather than God, uninviting God from the party, inviting Satan into our lives is through wallowing in our guilt and our shame. Adam and Eve, after they give in to the temptation, after they eat this meal with Satan, they are overwhelmed with guilt and shame. This is what the Bible means when it talks about the recognizing their nakedness and, and covering themselves with fig leaves. And if you keep reading the story, it goes on that they, in fact, try to hide from God. They try to run away from Him and then... When he finds them and he questions them about what have you done and, and why are you hiding? Well, the answer becomes they were afraid. They were filled with guilt and shame. And this guilt and shame does a few things. One, it completely destroys their relationship and their view of God. And so instead of running to him out of love and running to him knowing that he will forgive them, they run away and hide. So after they uninvite God from the meal, from the guest list, they push him further and further away with their guilt and shame and they're, they're hiding from him. But the reason they're hiding is because they're trying to fix it themselves. This is the point of them sowing fig leaves upon themselves. They're like, well, I've made a mess of this, so now I'm going to fix it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it all back together on my own. So instead of trusting in God, they begin to trust in themselves that they will be able to save and fix themselves. And finally, it ruins their relationships 
with each other. As soon as God begins to ask them about what happened and they recognize their shame and their guilt and the, and the things that they've done wrong, they begin to blame one another and they begin to blame Satan and say, it was, it was the woman, it was the serpent, it was anybody but me. This problem, this mess exists because of everybody else. So they play the blame game. I wonder how good you are at winning that game of making sure everybody else is to blame, everybody else is at fault except for you. See, we act like Adam and Eve in all kinds of ways. We choose to uninvite God and invite the way of Satan into our lives when we ignore His Word, when we think, I will be like God, I will be the one in charge, I will be the one in control of all things in my life. We act like Adam and Eve, and and we choose to ignore God, to uninvite Him, and to eat the meal with Satan when we live in our guilt and shame and we hide from God rather than seeking His forgiveness. Thinking to ourselves, I'll just cover up this mess with some fig leaves. I'll put on a good show so everybody thinks I'm perfect, I have it all together, I'm not in need of help. The whole time though we are being crushed by our guilt and shame and living in fear rather than living in grace and freedom. So we eat with Satan and uninvite God from the meal, just like Adam and Eve did when we play the blame game. When the fig leaves don't work anymore. When we can't just cover it up and pretend anymore. Instead of confessing, instead of seeking forgiveness, We begin to blame others and say, well, the fig leaves aren't working and and this happened and I had to cover it up because of this person, because of what they did, because of what they said. It's not my fault. See, the question to ask ourselves tonight as we think about this meal of Holy Communion is who are we eating with? Who are we inviting to the table of our lives? Are we eating with God? Are we inviting Him to be in control of all things? Are we inviting Him into our lives through confession so that we can be forgiven? Are we inviting Him in so that our relationships with others can be reconciled and healed? Or are we out of stubbornness and pride saying, you're not on the guest list anymore, God. We're going to eat with Satan. We're going to do it our way. We're going to fix it ourselves. We're going to rescue and save ourselves. See, this is our problem. Is that just like Adam and Eve, we have uninvited God from the meal. And in all kinds of ways, we have invited sin and Satan to be the guests at the table of our lives. And just like Adam and Eve, we are doing everything in our power to fix it ourselves. To keep God outside while we sow fig leaves and hide in fear and shame and guilt. What we need is not more hiding. It's not more blaming of others. It's not sowing more fig leaves. What we need is a new meal that brings to us forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. And this is the purpose of this evening. This is the purpose of Jesus coming and giving to us the meal of Holy Communion. We often refer to it as the Lord's Supper 
or the Lord's table. And I think that is so important to remember. Because oftentimes the reason we are in the messes that we are in, the reason we are struggling with fear, the reason we are overwhelmed with guilt and shame so often in our lives is because we've called it my table. This is my table and I get to decide who's invited. I get to decide who eats at this meal. And it's almost as if Jesus comes along and puts together His own table. And then on Maundy Thursday, He invites you and I to leave our table of sin and brokenness of fear and guilt and shame behind and say, would you like to eat at my table? Would you like to eat this whole new meal I am offering you? And in Mark 14, we get to read about this meal. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup after giving thanks. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Here is the meal. Bread and wine. But it's not just bread and wine. It's not just any regular meal. It's a better meal. right? We had the first meal with Adam and Eve. And we join them in that meal all the time in our pride and our sinfulness and our brokenness. And Jesus comes along and He offers to you a better meal. And it's not just a better meal because of what we eat. It's a better meal because of the company. It's not a meal with Satan and sin and death like our parents' first meal. Now it is a meal with Jesus, with God Himself coming to be our rescuer. Instead of being a meal that leads to fear and guilt and shame, a a meal that leads to all kinds of sinfulness and brokenness and fractured relationships, Jesus offers to you a meal that leads to forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. And so we see in this meal, Jesus is giving to us Himself. Because what we need is a better meal, a meal that undoes and heals and fixes all the problems that came from the first meal. A meal that gives us the forgiveness and the healing and the reconciliation we so desperately need. One of my favorite details about this night comes from the Gospel of Luke where Jesus tells His disciples, I have passionately desired to have this meal with you. What beautiful words. That first meal ends with Adam and Eve, with you and I running from God, trying to fix ourselves, trying to to hide our shame, trying to hide our guilt, trying to hide our brokenness from Him. And in this meal, in the Lord's Supper, in Holy Communion, in this better meal, Jesus doesn't wait for us to come to Him. He brings it to us. And he says, I've, I've passionately desired to have this meal with you. I know you've been running. I know you've been hiding. I know you've been trying to fix yourself. But I'm coming for you. I'm inviting you to a whole new table with a whole new meal where you will get the forgiveness that your heart needs. You will get the healing that your soul desires. You will get the reconciliation that your relationships desperately need. So when Jesus gives us this meal, He gives us Himself. 
We're not eating with Satan and sin and death anymore. We're eating with our Savior who says, This is my body. This is my blood. This is done for your healing. This is done for your forgiveness. And I love these words that he emphasizes that it is done for you. He doesn't say it's, it's done for folks over there and it's, it's done for the folks over there and it's done for the people over here who have, who have fixed themselves up enough. It's, it's for the people over here who have said sorry enough times. And he says, this is a meal for you. No matter how long you've been running, no matter how long you've been hiding, no matter what burdens of sin you are carrying, Jesus invites everyone to His table, to His meal, where you will receive the forgiveness, the healing, the reconciliation that you need. And the ultimate good news of this meal is that it's not just a promise for here and now, but it's a promise for all eternity. At the end of the Bible, in Revelation, we see a picture of heaven. And the picture that we are given is that it is called a marriage feast. It's a wedding reception. It's a giant celebration and party. It is a giant meal celebrating that we are now perfectly united as God's people with Jesus. That there is going to be no more sin or guilt or shame or death or tears or mourning or grief or sorrow that we will be with him for all eternity so the promise that Jesus is giving to you and I in this meal this evening is a promise that lasts forever in Revelation 19 says it this way write this blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. So you and I are blessed because through Jesus, you and I have been invited to that meal, to that heavenly banquet where we get to live and celebrate and rejoice with our Savior for all eternity. So, what Jesus has done for you this evening is He has undone all of the brokenness of that first meal. He has forgiven all the times that you and I have uninvited God from the guest list and eaten with sin and death and the devil instead. He has healed us of all of our guilt and shame. And He has given us reconciliation with God and with people. Because in this meal, He gives you Himself. And He gives you the invitation to eat with Him in joy and peace and celebration for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that You have given us this better meal a meal that gives us forgiveness and healing and reconciliation. Help us to always invite you into the meal and the table of our lives. Help us always to turn to you and receive that forgiveness, that healing, that reconciliation, that salvation that you give to us. And may we rejoice and celebrate that we are blessed because you have invited us to the marriage feast of the Lamb. In your name we pray. Amen. We now join together in prayer as the family of God, using the words that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you are fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my chest. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. 
you have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it.